Hi, are you an author? Are you wanting to sell more books? Do you want to get into press, but you just don't know how? Well, with me, I have got Shoni from Ambani Reputation Management, and he is has been in the industry for many years. I've known him for a very long time. And what I love about Shoni is that he understands small business owners and he know, understands big corporates and government and what makes a story newsworthy. Now, many of you are wanting to get into the press. You're wanting to have your book seen and reviewed, but how do you actually get that press release out there? And what is a newsworthy story? So Shoni, over to you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, how you got into the industry. Um, and thank you so, so much for taking the time to see us. We really appreciate this little slice of time that you've allocated us. Hello, Kim. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to your vlog. Um, well, as you said, uh, my name is Shoni. I, um, I've been in the industry for more than 20 years now. Um, but um, as life will have it, uh, it was a complete accident, uh, but an accident that led me to discover what my real passion is, which is uh, rare, but I'm, um, I'm happy that it happened. So I started off um, as a, uh, I mean, I studied insurance and risk management uh, initially, uh, worked for a bank, and uh, I got totally bored with the life in banking. Uh, lucky for me, I sat next to the then the wife of the deputy editor of Business Report, which is uh, one of the country's uh, uh, largest national uh, business uh, press. So she said to me, listen, uh, would you like to, uh, would you consider becoming a journalist? I said, listen, I know nothing about writing except letters to my uh, mom, which were generally very short, mom, I need more money. Um, and then I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to give up my day job. So what I'll do is I will do my eight to four at uh, the bank. And then I'll come at six o'clock until around nine, 10 in the evening at the newspaper and see how things work out. And um, I just fell in love with it immediately. So I gave up my uh, banking job, which was relatively well paid compared to the fact that I had to take a pay cut to become a, a journalist. Uh, first off, as a, a sub-editor, now these are the people who you should actually usually blame when the story goes wrong, because uh, sub-editors are the ones who take a story that a journalist has written and try and make it fit into what they call a geometry, that is the space allocated in the print newspaper. Uh, what usually happens is that they find themselves with more words than the risk space, and what do they do? They paraphrase. And sometimes what happens is that people end up saying, you know, I've been misquoted and so on and so on. We'll come back to this subject later. Um, after becoming a journalist, I, uh, as a sub-editor rather, I was then given an opportunity to write for the banking and insurance space because that was my background. I did that for a few years and they said, well, you know what, you're doing very well here. Why don't you take over the full bit? I did that for yet another year, uh, during which time I got a scholarship to Cambridge University to do a fellowship. Now, a fellowship, if you ask me, it's basically a time to reflect on your life, your career, but uh, you're also required to write a, a paper. So you kind of do a bit of studying as well. Um, so I did mine in Cambridge. When I came back, suddenly there were loads of offers from uh, the communication space because that's naturally what happens. Most journalists end up, uh, um, uh, when they progress their career, they end up becoming uh, uh, communication specialists. Why? Because they understand how the media works. Most of them can write and so on. And then I went uh, to, I took my, my first offer, the first offer I took was from Europa Communications, which I then uh, worked on uh, as a senior consultant, looking after financial services clients, including PwC, among others, and a few banking clients. Um, after that, then I went to NetBank, NetBank to EmpowerDex. Now, EmpowerDex at the time was the first uh, BE rating and advisory uh, organization. So we literally put that industry on the map because it was the first entity. And um, it probably is one of the best examples of how you can actually build a brand with zero budget uh, because um, there was absolutely uh, uh, no money uh, basically alloc allocated for that, um, uh, for that role. Um, I was basically um, the the, the, the marketing manager, the, uh, the marketing director, everything that, was, uh, uh, that we did for Empowerdex was done um, with uh, zero budget except my expertise. And um, by the time I left, Empowerdex was by far the most popular, uh, well-known uh, advisory uh, agency in the country. 
Now, after that, I then joined uh, Manning Salvage and Lee, which is a, a global uh, network of uh, communications uh, agencies. And I was head of the uh, Southern Africa uh, unit. Um, again, the challenge there was to literally re revive an organization that, was, that existed only in name, essentially. And by the time I left, you know, we had clients like uh, Virgin, we had uh, DBS, which is a global mining agent, uh, um, organization, uh, uh, and several um, uh, government departments, among others. And uh, I think I held two or three other uh, um, positions as MD of different uh, uh, organizations before I started Ambani Reputation Management. Now, one of the reasons that motivated me for start Ambani was that uh, most PR agencies tend to be runners, uh, glorified messengers. And I said, well, we need to inject a level of strategic thinking into this business. And that was the niche. And that essentially is where Ambani, uh, 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 that is our USP, you know, unique uh, selling uh, proposition. And that's where we differ most uh, with most uh, agencies. They come to us. Uh, because they know that they'll get the business understanding, the strategic uh, insight, um, as well as the classic PR publicity type of uh, exercises. Oh, by the way, along the way, I also did an MBA. <laughs> so that's in a nutshell uh, who I am. I remember the MBA days because you disappeared off the planet. Um, I was thinking of contacting the CIA and find out if it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, because, uh, <laughs> that's what MBAs do, unfortunately. I often say to people that um, it's not an, uh, a, 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 a test of your a level of intelligence, but uh, a, a test on your level of endurance, um, because they will throw so much at you so quickly. Uh, those who survive are people who actually are capable of dealing with that level of stress. Uh, which is why, unfortunately, you know, the advice is make sure you do it before you get married because you might just get divorced along the way. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> I, I think that that goes with, uh, with being an author. Um, I think that sometimes my husband recognizes the back of my head more than he, he recognizes my face because <laughs> when he comes from the bedroom and then he, I, start, I start writing roughly about three o'clock in the morning um, and then the first thing that oh, he sees is the back of my head. <laughs> So you meet on social media then, more often? <laughs> Actually, not that often because he, he, has, he has an aversion to social media. <laughs> but All right. if, if you're an author, you actually, you can't be scared of social media. Otherwise, you know, you would have very few readers. <laughs> so Shani, no, I mean, after going through masses of publications and listening to lots of, of people's woes in, in, the, uh, in the media space, what kind of advice would you give for an author who's starting out, who's wanting to build a, a reputation? How do, they, how do they, they, they build that narrative about themselves? How would they connect with the press? Obviously, if you've got a big budget, then like, everyone's going to pick up the phone and say, Shani, can you assist me? But if you don't have a budget and you're just starting out and you know you need to have some publicity, what are the first steps that an author would need to take? Well, one of the reasons why I mentioned Empowerdex in my intro was precisely because, you know, how do you make yourself bigger than you really are? Because essentially PR, that's what it is. And um, I'm sorry to uh, bring up uh, uh, the latest, uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Um, most people hear Donald Trump, this massively, incredibly successful businessman. Actually, no. You know, if Donald Trump had taken his investment and put it in, the, uh, uh, in some index fund, he probably would be wealthier than what it is today. As a businessman, I think he was a total failure. But as a brand, I mean, my word, everybody thinks he's this incredibly sharp, uh, astute businessman. So, and that's the PR that he built around himself. I'm not suggesting that people go out there and lie to build an image, but I'm saying, how do you accentuate the things that you're really good at so that people pay attention? And that's what we did as Empowerdex. Um, we were, one of the things that we started doing was, for instance, issuing reports on a quarterly basis. We call them powers and pundits. Uh, basically, uh, do a research around something like who's the most powerful director on the JSE. It's an interesting subject. It's an interesting topic. And suddenly, everybody wanted to know who we are. You know, how do we go about doing this research? And so on and so on. So news essentially has three components. What I call the time source content uh, uh, um, uh, 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 trio. You either something is timeless, as in it's happening right now, so it's newsworthy, 
or it's the source that makes it uh, newsworthy. So if I say that um, the economy will do very well this year, people will say, well, who the hell is Shoni Makari? But if Tabombeki, who is an economist, but a former president, says the same thing, it's newsworthy. Why? Because they know that he is in touch with, obviously, people who are in the know. So people will record that either because they think he's uh, lost the plot or it's news because he must know what he's talking about. And lastly, the content. So the substance of what you're saying is important. So as an author, and you're thinking about, you know, uh, going through the journey of becoming, uh, uh, you know, um, making your life about writing, telling stories, which is, I think, a wonderful opportunity, uh, obviously a good seller. The question is, how do you approach that story? Um, is this a story that is simply something that is well written? Or is this something that makes people sit back and say, wait a minute, this is a rather interesting twist to something that we all know. Let's say, for instance, you want to talk about, let's say you want to write about dragons, right? Most stories have been written about dragons, but what is unique, what is new about your dragon? You know, is it a dragon that actually comes and lives with people? Or are you suddenly, let's say you happen to find something uh, um, from uh, facts from paleontology and something, some new fact has emerged from paleontology and then you want to bring that story to life, uh, as it were, uh, but told with less science and a bit more accessible in a, a way that most people will find it interesting. So you take that aspect that is a scientific fact, but bring it to life in a way that is accessible to everybody else. Suddenly you have a story. You have a story that I might be interested in. You have a story that children might be interested in. You have a story that people in paleontology might be interested in because there's the fantasy aspect of the science that they love. I mean, take Jurassic Park. Of course, it doesn't exist, but uh, suddenly somebody brought the, in, the, uh, the graphics that made us enjoy uh, uh, um, the life of dinosaurs all of a sudden. Of course, you know, there was a lot of mayhem and they destroyed people, they, they killed people and so on. Well, that was this, the, the, the part of the storytelling in that medium that made it more interesting and more attractive. Cloning so, was very attractive at the time as well because people were talking a lot about cloning and essentially that's yeah. the technology that they used. Absolutely. So there was the timelessness aspect of it there, that uh, there was something that was happening in this, uh, uh, in, our, uh, uh, in, in this period right now and then they link that uh, with it. So it's always, uh, when we write press statements, for instance, because we have to write tons of press statements for our clients every single month. How do I get the media interested in something every month? So what I say usually is that journalists are more interested in something that they're already uh, engrossed in. So if we're talking about uh, COVID or health issues in general, it's a lot easier for a journalist to take a story that brings a new element to the uh, dialogue around COVID. So how do I take my story and align it or uh, link it with something that is happening right now? Uh, and right now, there are various uh, narratives that are obviously making the headlines. COVID, health, lockdowns, uh, the economy, and so on and so on and so on. So finding something that is interesting right now when you're writing that press release about your book uh, and link it to something that is happening right now, that will definitely get a, a journalist uh, uh, paying attention because it's an extension of a dialogue that they're already involved in, but a slightly different element of it. Because remember, journalists have the pressure every single day that most of us take for granted. They have to produce stories every day. We have to have newspapers every day. And they don't always have the news to tell every day. But when you come across with something that uh, is a continuation of, say, a story that they've already started on, and you're giving them a new perspective, voila. So besides a narrative, what do you have to, what are the key components that you have to have, um, you know, or how to get hold of you? What, what kind of things structurally should your press release have before you send it out? So the first thing, of course, you know, the, the general uh, structure of a press statement is, remember, a press statement is nothing more than a dialogue to engage. So you are inviting a journalist to interview you. Um, and that's what the press release uh, really is. So the headline has to be attractive. Uh, it has to say, read me, read me further. And within the first two paragraphs, you have to tell me who done what to whom when. 
I need to, so don't hide the story right in the middle of the paragraph because the average journalist receive anyway in the upwards of 20 to 30 emails every day with press statements. So why should I pay attention to yours? So right in the beginning, I need to be able to say, oh, okay, I need to pay attention to this. This, this is something I wanna uh, explore further. So you, the press statement may not necessarily be about the book that you're trying to publish. It might very well be about you, the author, something that you have discovered in the world of writing. And once I'm intrigued by that uh, subject, I will then invite you to come on my show on 702s, SAFM, and whatever the case might be. And along the way, because once you're there and it's live, that's when you can then talk about some of the things around the subject that you were in, invited in, uh, uh, to talk about. Because remember, um, journalists invite you to a interview because they have their own agenda. There are things that they want to find out more. You go there because you have your own agenda and your own agenda does not have to be the same as the agenda of the journalist. So I often say, if I'm, um, let's say I'm the minister of uh, health, right? And uh, my agenda is that I wanna tell people that uh, the, it's very important that we all participate in the vaccination program in the country. However, the question is um, something totally different. Um, there was uh, a person uh, ill-treated at a hospital somewhere uh, around the country. And you, you know, as a journalist, you ask, uh, Dr. Mkiza, you know, it, clearly uh, uh, our health system is failing our population. I mean, look at what happened to such and such a person. And uh, you know, um, if the doctor is well-trained in media, he will acknowledge this, well, you know what, there, we have challenges, but we're dealing with them. And uh, the government's priority is to make sure that we provide health uh, equally to all people. And for instance, as soon as we start unloading our vaccine uh, program, you will see that uh, there's a lot of planning that's being done. There's a lot of things that we're doing right in this country because we aim to deliver a million vaccines within one month to our first responders, our, uh, the, you know, the, the, our uh, women, men and women who are at the front line and so on. And so suddenly he's talking about something that, you know, is important to him. It's what we call his key message as opposed to what he was invited there to talk about. So you might be invited, for instance, to talk about, um, well, Kim, you have had quite a career. You know, you've moved from different entrepreneurial ventures and now you're an author. How does that work? And before you know it, you're there talking about your latest book. And that's how, that's how you get the attention. So it does not, if, you, if you're writing a press statement, it should not necessarily always be about you prioritizing the fact that you want to publicize a book. Is there something interesting happening in your life that you want to talk about that you, can, you could be considered an authority based either on your uh, history on your, uh, um, your career, uh, um, the position you hold in whatever organization, you get there. But once you are on the platform, make sure that you take control of the narrative. It should not be, you're not there to answer questions. Yes, you should answer questions, but that's not your agenda. That's a journalist agenda. Your agenda is to market your book. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, it looks like you have to kind of really think on your feet. <laughs> but I pretty think much. that the average author is pretty creative. So uh, they can twist the story and the words so that the, the right kind of thing comes out. Next question. If you are starting completely fresh and you're approaching publications, um, mm. who would you be looking for? Are you looking for the lifestyle um, uh, editor or who, who's the person that you actually need to target when you're sending out your pre statement? So there's a concept called uh, uh, spray and pray approach uh, in, uh, in, our, in our industry. And that's the one that we discourage people from doing. So that depends on, are you a fiction writer? Are you, what kind of a writer are you? Who is your target audience? So on that basis, you will then need to do a little bit of research to find out, okay, what are the shows that discusses um, uh, food, uh, for instance, or adventure or fiction or whatever the kind uh, might be, because they're all out there. Uh, that's why we have very many niche publications and niche uh, radio talk shows and, uh, and, so, and programs and so on and so on. So once you understand who those people are, then you go into the, because their details are available. It's very easy to get hold of a journalist who is responsible or their producers, because obviously the anchor is not the person who does the research about which issues we need to uh, put on our program this, uh, uh, this coming uh, period. So the, the, the producer will handle that. And so you get hold of the producer um, and you tell them, uh, or you write them a narrative. Um, because journalists are so busy, you, picking up a call and call them and say, listen, I was wondering if I could come into your show so I can discuss it. They'll still tell you back to say, well, you know, why don't you put it down? You know, write something 
Um, it doesn't have to be too long, and it doesn't always have to be in the press release format, although that tends to get you the most results. Uh, so write something, three to 450 words max, um, and uh, basically trying to uh, uh, explain what that story is. What is that uh, story that you want to, uh, you would like to be uh, invited uh, uh, to talk about? And once you've done that, uh, they'll look into it and, um, and uh, uh, hopefully you, you get invited uh, into, into the show. But understand your target audience, uh, the demographic you're trying to reach, and what are these radio stations, what are the different platforms, what are the different publications that speak to that demographic? Because if you're writing about adventure and then you call Business Day, uh, there's no chance in hell that they're gonna publish you. <laughs> they're a business publication. It's as simple and straightforward as that. Um, however, if you go to Gateway, um, uh, for instance, which is purely about that, you know, you have a better chance of being published by somebody in that space because, you know, there's alignment in terms of what they do and what your, what, uh, your stories are about. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, you can't just get into the press once and think, oh, well, I'm now going to make oodles of, of money. I mean, there's a difference between selling and, and, and publicity. So if, someone's, if someone is wanting to say, look, my primary target is that I want to sell as many books as possible. How do you work? What would your strategy be? Because um, I need to be able to say, okay, first step, I need to get my name out. Next step, mm -hmm. I need to do this. And then what, what is that sort of life cycle of starting from brand new to getting to a place where you are actually seeing tangible results for being in the press? So that's a very good question, Kim, because uh, think um, Quentin Tarantino. When Quentin first made his first movie, uh, Reservoir Dogs, I think it was, um, low, low budget, but it was unique. It was done so differently, and suddenly anything Quentin Tarantino was a hit. Uh, it doesn't mean he dropped his uh, creative standards, uh, but you almost need that one thing that will catapult you into uh, the public domain. So that, uh, for instance, if anyone wants uh, uh, to talk about um, uh, anything in your space of uh, your area of expertise, you have the first right of refusal, uh, essentially. So there's something called, we, you know, you have to be available. Um, journalists uh, work with people who are available when they need them because they faced, so for instance, if somebody had to call and say, listen, tomorrow morning we've got this slot, uh, you know, I had you on 702, can you please participate on this thing on uh, SAFM uh, tomorrow morning? You've gotta be available. Uh, because the moment you're not available, they're not gonna call again. But if you're available all the time, then you get to have the first right of refusal. And suddenly you're taking your name out there. Um, because one, they know, well provided of course, that after that first interview that you, you, know, you, you nailed it. Uh, uh, and you gave them the kind of information that they needed and it was given in a way that is accessible and is educational, a bit entertaining as well. Uh, so bring out all that creativity uh, uh, that uh, writers uh, uh, ought to have. And uh, before you know it, you will be the authority in that particular subject all the time. And um, so it's about getting your first big hit, uh, essentially, but allowing that to continue, and, but you have to leverage, because there's a tendency for people to think that, well, you know what, I was on ENCA um, two weeks ago, so I'm famous, everybody knows me. Well, no, um, for, you know, for all you know, some of the most important people you wanted to listen to that interview weren't listening at the time. Um, so one of the reasons why I often say uh, getting published is better than being on a radio or a TV, for instance, is because uh, uh, you know, magazines and newspapers have slightly longer chef life, especially now that we have digital. Once something is on digital, it doesn't die. It will be there all the time. Uh, so you want to be on those platforms uh, because uh, you preferably you want to be published as opposed to being on radio or TV. Uh, because um, yes, they might, these days they make podcasts and then they post it online and it will be available and, and so on and so on. But every time I Google Kim, I need to be able to see all those articles that were written about you uh, uh, and uh, um, then, because remember, uh, uh, producers also do their research. So they'll say, for instance, they want to talk to somebody who's an expert on safaris. Uh, the Google Safari, and uh, whose name appears, you know, the first three uh, responses. It, it's your name, and um, you know, obviously, you must be an authority. Then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll. 
But over and above that, like anything else in business, be it publishing or whatever kind of entrepreneurial venture you are in, make friends with them, go find them, go hang out with them, tell them your story and uh, develop personal relationships. Uh, because ultimately, they will get, when, you, when you invite somebody for coffee or tea or lunch or whatever the case might be, you know, they get to know a bit more in depth about who the person behind that press statement or that book is. And uh, you give them ideas in different areas where you can take them in terms of the different engagements that you might end up with. Um, I'm so sorry, Kim. I am sweating like hell. It's, uh, it's really, really hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that, but we'll just blame it on the dragons because you know I've got these <laughs> copper fire dragons that are just all over the place. <laughs> and their fire is hotter than any of the other dragons at all. So it, you probably have one of those in the in the room with you. <laughs> so yeah, that's actually that's very interesting um, because uh, I do find the more that you know about someone, um, the, you know, the more interesting your questions are they're no longer superficial because you understand yeah. more of the in-depth part of of the person so um hmm. someone like myself let's just use that myself as a hypothetical example and then i'm going to use another author so it doesn't look too biased it is biased because i'm the one <laughs> interviewing you <laughs> but my books are yes they're about dragons but the underlying uh, uh core belief that i'm trying to put over is that i'm trying to address um, social issues that affect all people, but particularly young people, because I find that um, I always mention Game of Thrones because Game mm. of Thrones has got dragons in, it's got epic battles and that kind of thing. But essentially, that's not something that I want my teen to be watching. In, in fact, there's some adults that will watch a couple of the episodes and they'll be mortified. I, I love medieval and I've always loved medieval, but when I sat down to watch it with my husband and, you know, as soon as there's some medieval thing on, I'm like, oh, I want to watch it with you. Um, yeah. And that will be like a kind of a mini date. But when Game of Thrones came on, and I mean, it's been so widely publicized, I looked and I thought, I don't have the stomach for this show. Uh, there's just too much, like really intense, cruel violence and, you yeah. know, some of the sexual parts <laughs> and the swearing, which some of the yeah. words that they use in there, I don't actually think they would have used in medieval times. We use completely different words. But yeah. <laughs> so it kind of mortified me and I thought to myself, well, there has to be, there has to be a story that's got the intensity and the complexity of it without being like that you're, you're as a parent, your censorship, you know, barrier comes up. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that, that I started writing where I am plus to have wisdom going in because I find that as a society, we're very much into entertainment, but we're not really realizing that what goes into your mind at some point is going to produce a harvest in your life. So I yeah. wanted to write that part where, so, you know, the, the second book had, deals a lot with um, unplanned pregnancies, um, yeah what what the person actually goes through so it's something that you could give to your team that doesn't want to talk to you about issues but it's in the story so yeah. what kind of what what would you advise if i came to see you professionally what would you advise me to do what would be um the kind of publication i would need to go into how would i present my story so I mean, taking into account, of course, what I said earlier, that uh, you need to, uh, you need, still need to understand your demographic uh, and obviously people who, um, uh, that, that particular publication uh, reaches out. Um, you, you, want, you want a story that has many elements uh, in it, uh, and, um, but also you want a story that has longevity. So if, let's say we're talking about dragons, so they this story might be actually about dragons, what people's perceptions are, and so on and so on. And then dragons as within a social construct of some sort. Uh, uh, so then you are unpacking uh, within the human uh, social construct, but using dragons for maybe accessibility for children or, or people in such a way that, you know, being able to say things much the same way that, uh, you know, uh, psychologists use puppets uh, so they can talk to difficult subjects uh, with children. Um, so you might want to do that. Uh, so you want a story that can be unpacked over a longer period of time. Um, uh, because that way you're essentially saying to the person you're, you're engaging with that, um, you know, 
let me come back next week so I can take to talk to you about that next aspect of this story. And then the week after, and then, and so on and so on. So often we want to download everything in one go. And that doesn't help if you want to make sure that you are consist consistently in the press over a long period. So take that one subject, unpack it and say to yourself, okay, today I'm going to focus on this issue. And then, but however, I want to intrigue the journalist about the other element uh, within the story so that they absolutely start to enjoy almost this continuous uh, 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 engagement uh, uh, with you. Uh, and that way, excuse me, uh, when we also do our PR, when we have a story, let's say uh, Tiger Brands is going to donate 100 million rands to build a new medical facility. So first there's an announcement that there was this partnership with government or university that's going to do X, Y, Z. Boom, you leave it there. And then the appointment of the head of this, uh, of this institution, right? The history behind him, what is accomplished and so on and so on. Boom, leave it there. The first research project that you're gonna focus on and why? You know, because well, maybe infectious diseases are a bigger problem in Africa than other parts of the world. Boom, you've got that. So suddenly the one issue has longevity that you can talk about for an entire year. So you wanna pick stories that uh, you are packaged in such a way that uh, you can divide into smaller bits over a period of time. And then you're able to, uh, you're able to uh, then have that continuous engagement uh, with the press, taking your name out. But remember, each time you go to that engagement, always remember that, uh, yes, I've intrigued the journalist. Yes, we are on a path together but I still have something important I want to say about uh, either my book or me as a person. How do I, you know, what will today's discussion help me sell more books? Uh, so preparation, one of the things that we do when we do media training is that don't try and win uh, uh, engagements uh, with the press, prepare, prepare all the time. One of the things that journalists don't like is for instance, you going out there and say, well, can you send me the 10 questions that you'll be asking me today. Well, you know, you've, you, you are the one who came to me and said you want to engage. So come, let's engage. But then don't then come to me and give me pressure on what it is that I'm going to ask. I'll think about what I'm gonna, uh, so, uh, 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 you know, talk to you about. So what you do is you, see, you create some sort of a scenario for yourself. Okay, if this is the topic, what are the possible 15, 20 questions that would come from this engagement? And, once, and then you try to answer them the way in which you believe will help you deliver that key message that you want to deliver at the end of that engagement. Thanks very much, Shani. Now, things going wrong. So you work very strongly in reputation management. We were chatting earlier on about two particular scenarios that were quite difficult. The one was a, a lesser known author um, who accidentally uploaded the wrong publication into Amazon. So when the launch came and people wanted to download the the, um, the book, they, they got the wrong book, which uh, <laughs> for some readers really annoyed them. Um, and then also we've got the challenge that Amazon has been so inundated with, um, with issues that were related to lockdown um, mm -hmm. because everyone is now, you know, home shopping. And yeah. uh, so their lead times are quite extensive. It used to be that I would upload a book and it would be live within 72 hours. Um, mm -hmm. But recently the book that I wanted to launch in December uh, they came back to me after 10 working days and then said could you please take care of this issue with the cover and that means I've got mm -hmm. to take care of the issue with the cover and so it actually ends up being that the final product is going to come out 20 working days instead of 10 so when when you've got a problem like that um, and then I'm going to just remind you of the second one a local author who wrote a book an incredibly well, um, you know, big celebrity in South Africa. She wrote a book. There were errors in the book. And uh, then the bookstore had a lot of returns. Um, and they basically said, look, we don't care who you are. But yeah. at the end of the day, your attitude towards the errors in the book means that we're not letting you come back into the bookstore because you've tarnished our reputation, not just your yeah. own reputation. So the, the indie author, who's the person who's doing everything themselves, it's their reputation that they're tarnishing. But the person who is being published, who's going to a 
bricks and mortar um, place, they are tarnishing the reputation of the bookstore. How would a person unpack that? What would be the crisis management that you would have to go through to, to deal with those issues that you have some kind of a comeback? So one of the reasons why I have a job is because uh, reputation management is not so much what you do when you're hit with a crisis, but what you do every day so that you build a reputation so that the day you're hit with a crisis, people will give you the benefit of the doubt. So that is the sort of uh, uh, the long-term view of it. But however, let's say you have not had the opportunity to do that and uh, you are hit with a crisis as things uh, do happen. Um, the slogan is tell the truth, tell it fast and tell it fast. Um, people appreciate being taken seriously. Uh, uh, rather than some, say something goes wrong. You know something has gone wrong. You're the one who discovers it, hopefully, uh, and yet you sit on it uh, instead of actually approaching the people who are going to be impacted by that uh, and then start, well, you know, uh, informing them while you're also taking uh, corrective action uh, because crisis management is not simply about apologizing. It's uh, one, taking responsibility. Two, uh, making sure that you're taking corrective action that is uh, believable um, and actually communicating that, uh, that corrective action. It's, it's uh, uh, the, the tendency, unfortunately, especially in corporate, which is what I face all the time, is that uh, big executives tend to think that uh, when there's a crisis, they go down and hide in the basement, and then that's when their spokespeople should be out at the forefront and dealing with it. Well, as an author, you are the business, so you don't have the luxury of a marketing manager that you can send to go solve your problems. You have to solve those problems. You have to be the face of uh, the stakeholders that you are dealing with. So first and foremost, who are the stakeholders and rank them? Who are the most affected and who are the most impactful? And uh, who are the ones that I need to deal with first and uh, very, very quickly so that I bring them uh, onto my side? Uh, of course, uh, uh, the approach and the attitude you take will determine how well you solve a particular problem. So if you come with the attitude that I'm a big celebrity, people should just kneel before me and say, they are not, you know, we're not worthy, you're not gonna solve that problem. But if you humble yourself and actually demonstrate that this is not the way you do things, this is just life that happened to you, uh, and you will go to any length to make sure that uh, uh, things are, are corrected and done, and, and done, and done properly. Um, some people, as I said, might give you the benefit of the doubt. But if that has been your modus operandi to say that uh, uh, in everything I do, uh, I need to do it with integrity so that every time I'm continually adding to that uh, a little bit to my reputation. Uh, because one day, it's not an if question, it's a when question. One day things will go wrong. They might go wrong spectacularly or it might just be a small problem. But if I had established a track record of doing things in a particular way. You're actually managing the, the, the crisis that, has, that is yet to occur. I often tell people that imagine, for instance, you one day there's a story saying that Archbishop Desmond Tutu was caught stealing sweets at uh, pick and pay. Well, there's no way I'll believe it until I hear more. So what am I doing? I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Why? Because he spent his entire life building a particular reputation. And as an author, you have to continually so instead of focusing on crisis, it, how do I do it? Focus on what do I do every day now as I'm building my career and my reputation? Because one day I will need to draw from that credibility bank. And when I need it, it better be full. You know, there's nothing like going there and you, know, you open up and uh, you know, you've, you've pissed off, excuse the, the, the words, so many people that uh, you know, it's almost people, it's almost like, oh yeah, you know, it's about time that uh, he's getting his comeuppance or she's getting her comeuppance uh, because people were just tired of the attitude that, uh, you know. So the fact that you one day are going to become famous and rich, uh, don't let that get into your head. Or the fact that suddenly you published one big book and it's a massive hit, uh, don't let that get into your head because someday things will go wrong and you want people to remember how you behaved when you were right on top and yet you continue to treat people like normal human beings. Uh, and to me, that is essentially what reputation management is about because it gives you that uh, buffer uh, while you're hit with a crisis. It gives you that buffer so that you're able to get your ducks in a row and manage things and be able to go to the stakeholders that are affected and say, listen, this is as you know me. You know, we've been working together for the past two, three years. This is not how I do things. 
and uh, explain how this came about. Give context. Let them understand the circumstances you were facing. And they will probably, open above that, they might become your allies and partners in helping you solve that problem. Uh, and when you have built a bigger network of people who are now understanding and helping you uh, deal with the problem, suddenly so the problem disappears a lot quicker than it would if you're standing alone and you're facing six missiles from six different uh, uh, directions. So crisis management is actually starts by building your reputation. So build your reputation every day because one day, once you build that credibility, that's when you need to draw from it in order to successfully deal with the crisis. That's excellent advice. I mean, you know, what a lot of uh, people don't realize is as authors, we are businesses. Um, mm. In terms of, you know, when, I, when I'm doing my course, I say to people, if you have a look at financially how um, the world is working, only 5% of people can actually afford to retire if they have got a retirement annuity or retirement plan. And mm. if you've got a, a, a catalog of books, those books are always going to be sold at the current rate. So they are basically inflation, inflation proof if you have built it well. And if you build it, if you treat your author business like a business, it's going to pay you as a business. But that does mean that you need to treat it as a business. You need to take your reputation seriously, your financial management seriously. And that's the part of what this channel is about. And we call the channel Write, Learn and Earn so that you're not just a writer, you're learning the whole time and at the end of the day, you're going to be able to earn. Um, well, on that subject, I'm sorry to interject. Uh, there's something that is happening in Parliament. Uh, I'm talking now about the issue of uh, uh, authors being able to retire comfortably. Uh, it's the uh, Copyright Amendment Bill and it's going to make authors' lives very, very difficult. Why? Because they want to make it easy for people to copy without paying royalties. Uh, um, uh, now, there's uh, two sides to that argument. However, uh, book publishers are actually going to be affected the most, uh, as well as people produce uh, music and so on and so on. So imagine uh, already you have those kind of environmental issues that are developing around you, which means the work that you have to do, you know, uh, has to be twice as good uh, to be able to survive this uh, 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 oncoming uh, train, basically. How does that bill actually affect us specifically? Well, um, without getting into the details, basically they, what they're trying to do is they call, they're calling it fair use argument, that uh, we want to get the material that you've done to as many people as possible, particularly material that is used to educate. So it's probably gonna affect people who are in the education space, so people who are writing what they call textbooks, uh, more often than perhaps people uh, in your space. Uh, because uh, suddenly you, the, the amount that you'll be paid, I, I don't have the, the exact facts with me because this just landed on my desk uh, in December because we have to, one of my clients uh, and, and I have to respond uh, to this and sensitize uh, uh, both uh, the legislators and uh, the industry in particular, how they're going to be affected by it. Uh, and that, you know, it is a terribly bad idea. Uh, 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 so that is the, the work that we'll be doing uh, uh, soon. So watch this space because uh, in, a, in effect, we'll be fighting for your rights uh, uh, very soon. I can, I can see that I'm going to be calling you in a few months time and say, Shani, by the way, follow up <laughs> interview. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we've covered a lot. I always have to get a little anecdotal story on something that's happened to you in, your, in terms of your career that's been like either a highlight or like a, uh, like a bombshell that's, that's landed on you that has affected your career um, or the career of your clients and how you've handled that. So thanks, thanks Kim. So what, what happened uh, was, uh, I think it was three or four years ago, um, a certain airline, I won't mention it by name, I uh, don't want to be sued. <laughs> um, I had a, a job at Cape Town route, uh, like many other airlines. So one uh, uh, afternoon when the plane was taking off from Cape Town, the plane loses an engine. Literally, an engine, engine fell from the sky. Uh, and obviously there was a, a pandemonium. Everybody's worried, well, are we going to land? Are we going to get back to Jobek? And so on and so on. But immediately, the story hits the papers. It was front page everywhere. Day one, front page. Day two, the story is evolving, as I was saying earlier. 
And I'm thinking, what are these people doing about this? Uh, it turns out they were doing nothing. So I, one of the first few times I learned how to call call clients. I had never done it before. Um, and uh, I called the CEO and I said, well, I, I see that uh, you, you're being murdered in the press and there doesn't seem to be any uh, response. There's no campaign to kind of educate, uh, bring the subject from your perspective, what happened and so on. Uh, and the CEO at the time says, well, actually our lawyers are handling it. I'm thinking, no, your lawyers don't fly your planes. I fly your plane. You need to give confidence to the people who fly your plane that all is well. That was a once-off event. And uh, he wasn't particularly convinced, so he said, okay, fine. We'll give you one week and we'll see what uh, happens uh, afterwards. And uh, of course, you know, one, uh, crisis management 101. The question I asked myself first, what went right? Well, the plane did land. Nobody was injured. That's the story. The journalist story is that the engine fell from the sky. Our story is that we had a pilot, a captain, who kept everybody calm, he's the hero, let's celebrate him. And suddenly, that very first weekend, the entire narrative was around what this pilot did. Incidentally, and I'm not saying they learned from me, maybe they did, uh, a couple of years later, a similar story happened in the US where a plane actually landed on the Hudson River. Um, and all the newspapers were focusing on the pilot and how he managed to contain that, he managed that situation in terms of people's consent, those who were on the plane, uh, and so on and so on. So for me, it was actually cementing the idea that, you know what, for every issue, there's always a good side. Every story has two sides. And it became clearer to me on that uh, uh, incident that uh, it depends on what bit you want to focus on. Which side are you on and whose context are you going to provide? And we provided the context of the airline that, you know what, yes, we understand that is something unusual, something very scary when uh, an engine falls off uh, an airplane. But one, it says nothing about our maintenance processes. It says nothing about our equipment. It says nothing about our, the quality of our planes. So we went into all that spiel where we're trying to explain that all is well. This is a once off. And by the way, we also have a hero here. And that shows, that should show you just how well trained our pilots are. And the situation turned around uh, completely. Um, you're a little low, uh, Kim. Your voice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so actually, I think I watched a movie about the one with the Hudson River because I think it had Tom Hanks in it. Um, mm. He was the pilot that landed the, the plane in the Hudson River. Mm. I can actually, like, I can see it now in front of me. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that a little bit of a, a flashback. <laughs> so it definitely started uh, um, by the time the Hudson happened, yes. our airline situation had happened already. So, like I said, the script was exactly the same. Uh, yes. They focused on the hero and uh, yes. that worked uh, that worked in both instances yeah yeah because i mean i'm like i would be terrified to go and fly in a plane where like no one has got like a reason why the lemon engine fell off the plane <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd rather get an ox wagon to go to cape town and fly that plane <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask you, because this is a book um, interview, I want to find out what is the book that has really stood out for you as a book that's really shaped your thinking as a, as a person, one that you would recommend to anyone? Well, um, Kim, you've known me for a while, so you know that I take an interest in all things scientific, especially uh, things around cosmology, cosmology being the study of the evolution of the universe. Uh, one of my favorite authors was a professor from Princeton, um, uh, Richard Feynman, and he wrote a book called The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. Now, why did I like that book? Because it took, and to me, that is the example of genius, taking an extremely complex subject and make it accessible to somebody like my mom, whose highest uh, education was the standard six, and she could read that book if I had to give it to her, I mean, if she was still around. Um, and so you don't even need a scientific background. It actually explains even the basic laws of motion in such a way that uh, the average person can actually access uh, some of the things that people consider to be the secrets of the universe. And the universe actually has very few secrets. Uh, we just need to find out. But often the subject is told in such a complex manner. I mean, you open one of the first, uh, you know, the, the first page in a book on quantum physics, you won't read past paragraph two you know, because it looks alien completely, everything. And yet this guy took that subject, that very complex subject of science, physics, quantum physics, the universe, and explained it in the most accessible manner 
possible. And I would recommend that most people read that because it's often, sometimes when people tell you, uh, you know, one of the slogans I use a lot is that please don't outsource thinking. Don't let other people do the thinking for you. And sometimes we do allow people to do the thinking for us because we don't have the information ourselves. So the next time somebody tries to have a conversation with you about the you know, uh, philosophy, general things around uh, science, armed with that book, you can actually participate in that conversation with some relative confidence, I must say. Thanks for sharing that. I think that for me, the book that has impacted me the most, and I've read so many books, is probably The One Minute Millionaire. And mm. uh, the reason that I say that is because it's written um, in it with a dual function. So um, obviously, I, you know, I've studied, I've done some business studies and that. And, and yes, like you were saying, sometimes you open the book and then you think to myself, oh, no, I'm so bored. So the average motivational book that I've got uh, or business book, I start reading several times. And if it's very good, then I will finish reading it once. <laughs> But what was great about the One Minute Millionaire is that it took the principles that they were trying to teach you and it, they wove it into a story. And the story is essentially about a, a young woman whose husband dies and she loses her children to her in-laws. Um, and at some point when she, she's completely down and out, she meets a, a, um, a woman who mentors her and they challenge her to go and see her father-in-law. And she takes this outrageous bet that she will make a million dollars in a certain period of time. If she makes it, he will give her the kids back. And if she doesn't make it, she will never be allowed to see her kids ever again. Well, that book <laughs> was finished <laughs> and it took so many business principles that I'd learned about when I was studying uh, marketing management but that I forgot after the exam was passed it took those and it put it in an emotional context when mm. you are just like on the edge of your seat and it's a flipping business book <laughs> <laughs> And so I love that book. And that's one of the inspirations um, that I had for my books was I thought, is there a, a, are there principles that I would want to teach my kids that if I was just telling them, if I was lecturing them or talking at them, like, please don't do this or please don't do mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, then they're like, going, oh, mom. <laughs> but if I gave them a story with that wisdom in it, which was what used to happen like years ago, you would sit around the campfire, you would tell your stories about what happened, you know, the villager that you met, uh, when you went hunting, what, what strategy you need to use. And, and you would learn so much about those kinds of stories that um, that you were engaged with instead of just reading like this boring book like these are the five elements that you need to yeah, yeah. You know, just like your, your story now about the the, the airline um, that that yeah. we are in, engrossed in that because you're like what the blooming engine falling out you know so then that makes the principles that you are saying that tell the truth tell it tell it first and tell it quick Very that fun. makes a lot yeah. of sense to us now because we've got the context of the story Absolutely. In fact, I think the, the best way to teach people I've found is to teach one of the, uh, the, call it the side jobs I do is as a, a, a business mentor with the Black Umbrellas, uh, previously Shandruka Black Umbrellas. And one of the things that I do is I always tell a principle and uh, sugarcoat it with, by a story. So as they unpack the layers, it's big, but also because the principle of association, it's a lot easier to remember a particular issue if it's linked to something that was pretty significant or impactful and I found it's a lot easier I wish my teachers when I was in school had developed that technique in terms of teaching us various principles about many other subjects which uh, because that'll be that would have been great I found I would have remembered a heck of a lot more than I did because instead I was taught to memorize things and uh, however if you find a principle and then surround it or put it within the context of a story it's so much easier uh, to be able to recall and then and also have the proper context because then you also know the proper application of that principle uh, yeah. that you're being people are sharing with you um I think it would work very well with history as well because i remember one date 
in 1615 mm. or 1652, Jan van Riebeek landed at the Cape. I remember yeah. that date. But there's <laughs> so much more interesting stuff behind history um, that, you know, like today I learned I was watching this thing where they said that um, when Germany went and they sent their troops into, um, into Russia, masses of German soldiers died of the cold. And apparently mm. there have been officials that have come to Hitler and said, these trains and things that we are using to transport the Jews to the death camps, can we mm. not load up some of those trains with, with food and provisions? Um, mm. And can we take some of the guys that are, are patrolling and working at the camps, can we take them and send reinforcements to Russia? Mm. And Hitler said, no, I, that's not going to happen. Then now I'm thinking, ooh, that's an interesting story. I want to find out more about that because okay. it's a story. It's not like, I'm not saying it's like in this year, this is how many German soldiers died in Russia. That's uh, boring. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think uh, the art of storytelling, and um, this is something, um, uh, and um, I'm not saying this so you can invite me again. This is one of the things I've always admired about you, Kim, that you are such a great storyteller. Uh, and uh, but, but the twists and turns, which is why, you know, I'm glad you eventually found your knitting, which is writing uh, uh, stories, because you tell in such a way that it's engaging. Um, so Thank to you. me, that's how you capture somebody's, uh, you know, somebody's imagination. Um, uh, and they get uh, totally, uh, uh, in, you know, engrossed in what, uh, what you're talking. I'm not a great reader of, uh, of uh, what you call them, of novels. And because I'm one of those people that once I pick a book and it's interesting enough, I want to finish it. I want to finish it that same day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, those that I've picked up, uh, you know, I've actually read them that way because uh, once I'm, uh, you know, uh, engrossed in a particular uh, issue or a story, um, that's it. I'm hooked until, until it's done. I mean, uh, the difficulty for me was reading, I don't know if you know, uh, um, Anthony Robbins, uh, Awaken the Giant Within You. It's a thick book. Um, incidentally, that's one of the books that actually changed my life altogether because he, he basically said in that book, start asking more from yourself. Mm. You know, if you want a better life, start asking more from yourself. Uh, I read, that was the only motivational book I've ever written, um, I've ever uh, read. And uh, I can go back to it any day. Uh, and again, the great thing about Anthony Robbins is that he talks about stories. We'll talk about the story that, uh, a principle around a story involving Nelson Mandela. Uh, and we move on. To, he interviews so many world leaders uh, in business, in politics, and so on. And you are, uh, inevitably going to remember that particular issue that he's talking about because it's linked to a particular great leader that you know in history. And that's why he's such a great storyteller. That's why he's such a great motivator. And I, ne I never thought much about motivational books until I read Awaken the Giant Within You. I didn't read that book, but I have followed him quite extensively um, on his talks. The book mm. that, made, that made a big change to me, which actually pushed me to continue with my writing because I started, write, uh, I started telling stories when South Africa had their first load shedding. And mm. uh, you know my daughter Margaret, so this is like quite some time ago. Um, we didn't have gas cooker, we didn't have candles, we had like nothing to prepare us and it was winter. And she was terrified and you know kids, I actually know a play therapist and she said, mm. Having a warm bath and knowing that you're going to have hot supper at a certain time at night gives children a sense of security. And so she was inundated with kids who were severely traumatized by the lack of electricity. So if you are accustomed to living without electricity, then that's like, oh, you know, it's another day in paradise. But if you are not accustomed to it, the, the kids used to take a lot of strain. And the only thing that I had was the power of my voice. So I would mm. start telling stories to her. And I always had this, that there must be a hero who has had to overcome some kind of challenges and it all worked out in the end. And so a lot of my storytelling is around that. And it was something that I developed over time. And she would, we, to give her power, I would say, you choose the characters. So I had some really interesting things. I mean, there's like a crocodile and a butterfly, like, you know. <laughs> so I had to make up stories based on those two or three characters that were given and my, my younger daughter is now still doing that. 
And my mm. husband said to me, write your stories down. I'm like, oh, yeah, but, you know, I had the reasons. And then, like, okay, well, can you record them? Yeah, well, you know, I had reasons for that as well. Um, and then in 2018, I had a friend who read something that I wrote, and she, she came to see me. She, she'd been in my industry. She used to be one of my suppliers. And she said to me, you need mm. to stop doing what you're doing, and you need to move into writing. And I'm like, yes, but. <laughs> and then she says, like, I didn't come here to listen to you, yes, but you tell me all the problems and we're going to solve those problems because you are going to self-publish and you don't have to worry about 15,000 rejection letters. Mm. So I started, but then I got stuck. I'm like, I had the typical imposter syndrome. Mm. I can't do this. And the book mm. that made a big change for me was Blair Singer's Little Voice Management. So as you mm. know, I am a Christian. Um, other people will have a, 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 a conversation about what is a good Christian or a bad Christian, but that is my belief system. And mm -hmm. there was a section in the book where he said that he has got a, a gift that he wants to deliver to the world and he uses people through that. So whether you are mm -hmm. a heart specialist or, or a PR specialist or whatever, there's something that he wants to deliver to the world through you. And mm -hmm. when you say no to that, it is an act of disobedience. And then I'm like, okay, how do I finish this manuscript? Because <laughs> I had this vision of arriving on the day of judgment and God's like, do you see this stack of books? And then he like yes. flips them open and there's no words on the pages. He's like, these yes. are the books you were supposed to write. <laughs> One of the things that I, I often say to people is that um, in any situation, you can find reasons why something should happen or you can find reasons why it shouldn't happen and you'll find them in equal number. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's not from Anthony Robbins. That's my own thing that I developed over because I've, I've been confronted with many situations and depending on what I decided to focus on, things happen. So I, start, I will start writing uh, reasons why this ought to happen reasons why Ambani cannot fail, it's got to succeed as a business, because I now am responsible for so many people who have so many families who depend on this business. Yes, it's not just me, it's all of us as a collective, but those will be one of the reasons why it cannot fail. Uh, and uh, the more you start focusing on why things ought to happen, you will be amazed at how many things, and as you're writing those reasons, your level of motivation also is also increasing, why this definitely has to happen. So instead of sleeping at one o'clock, you sleep at three, writing that book, because it's gotta be done, because you don't wanna find it, uh, you know, confront the wrath of the Lord when you walk, <laughs> open the gates, and uh, there's a stack of, I don't know, 20, 30 books, uh, all empty, and uh, you kind of, mm, and eyeing your, your way, um, it's not gonna work, in, you know, in terms of your, obviously, uh, belief system. Uh, and suddenly, those are the reasons why those books have to be written, among many others, I'm sure. Tony, it's been so nice chatting to you. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and see us. And I, I'm very glad that we, we, we grabbed hold of you just before most of your clients come back to work or else I probably yes. wouldn't have heard of you from you for the next year. But you are definitely invited to come and tell us about that legislation. A final Absolutely. question. If people mm. are wanting to get hold of you um, because they're wanting you to handle uh, their, their corporate uh, PR and communication, or um, I, I do know that you have on occasions dealt with some individuals, um, mm. but then uh, obviously there are very special circumstances on that. How would they get hold of you? So very simple. We have a website, um, but uh, you can also just send email at shoni at ambani.co.za or info at ambani.co.za um, or just go to our website and drop us a, a, a little message and we'll get back to you definitely within 24 hours uh, of receiving that email. And um, one last disclaimer, Kim. Uh, um, I know you probably didn't notice, but I have been doing two things at the same time today, which is why I'm sweating all of them, thinking, hopefully this child doesn't appear somewhere. I'm busy babysitting while I'm talking to you, but luckily I'm elevated. So the reason you didn't see my hands so much is because I'm managing things around me here. So, so I hope that the next time the madam will be around so that I can actually have this uh, focus purely on our conversation and, uh, and uh, not have to use my hands 
uh, at the same time. So I looked like I was running the Olympics. <laughs> we all understand homeschooling has now all of a sudden increased in percentage. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. we, we all absolutely get that and uh, I've seen so many Zooms where there have been little people that have popped in. Mm -hmm. um, no one actually worries about that. The only people that are worried about that at the moment is because they are scared that their kids might be exposed to the international um, world. Um, but yes. yeah, we definitely, uh, we definitely don't have problems with that. You know, with me, I've got two little ones running around there. I had to um, make uh, lots of uh, management talks outside <laughs> before we started the zoom so shani thank you so much for for popping in to see us um i know that people are going to really enjoy this interview and um it's out there for the greater world because it's on youtube um and everyone if you need to get hold of shani i'm gonna put his details at the bottom so please remember to subscribe to this channel if you uh, are on Patreon, you can support me on my Patreon account. I'll put the link at the bottom for that as well. And if you've got any other ideas for videos that you think are going to be helpful to authors, please send me a note um, and put a comment in the chat. And so we'll make sure that that happens for you. Thanks, Shoni. And you have a stunning day. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.